Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the event. Uh, let me welcome you properly. So good morning, dear participants. I'm happy to start the book presentation of the assistant professor of the Grady School of Education, also a director of the Consortium Gender Scholars, Dr. Anna Cohen miller with the book titled Questions in Qualitative Social Justice Research in Multicultural Contexts. So in order to start the event, I would like to give the floor to the LAPO, Piotr Mihalic, the Acting Library Director, please. Mm -hmm. uh, we are participants from the online presentation of the book, Questions and Qualitative Social Justice Research in Multicultural Context. Dear Professor Cohen Miller, as a librarian, I am always pleased uh, when the library collection is uh, replenished with uh, new books. Librarians working uh, in university libraries are also fortunate enough to uh, interact and work with book authors. We value books uh, that contribute to the development of the intellectual, spiritual and emotional potential of readers. And we are also grateful to those who write such books because the success of the library mission in society depends on the inspiration and hard work. Since the mission of the university and society is to develop the culture of the intellect of a student, a graduate of the university, then the main conditions for mission success are not the textbook itself that the student studies at the university, but the teachers with whom he or she communicates during his her study. Today, I am especially pleased to participate in the book presentation as uh, Professor Chloe Miller is long time friend of Nazarbayev University Library and a partner in its many joint <coughs> projects. I am sure the, uh, the, Nazarbayev, the Nazarbayev University mission uh, will be fulfilled successfully if its uh, graduates will be similar to Professor Chloe Miller in a quote, the force, the steadiness, the comprehensiveness, and the versatility of intellect, the command uh, over our own powers, the instinctive just estimate of things as they passed before us, which sometimes indeed is a natural gift, but commonly is not gained without much efforts and the exercise of years. The end of quote. Even they and you uh, graduates won't write such smart and bright scientific monographs as the book which is uh, presented now. I am uh, pleased uh, to give to other participants of the online book presentation to hear about uh, the merits of the book and its authors. Of course, constructive criticism also welcome. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Piotr and Liza. Okay, let me go ahead and let me try to share my screen again. see on on its way and then i'm going to do one more thing which might change the view but let's look yep here we go oh getting close here all right how does that look for everyone okay great well hello again everyone thank you so much for being here it's really a pleasure so as most of you know, and as I was just introduced, so I'm Anna Cohen Miller, and I'm an assistant professor at the Graduate School of Education at Nazarbayev University and co-founding director of the Consortium of Gender Scholars. Thank you again so much to the NU Library for the invitation to speak and the dedicated work of Liza Kamilova and Piotr Lapo. Thank you so much to make this event happen today. So today I'm going to be speaking about my new book, Questions in Qualitative Social Justice Research in Multicultural Contexts, written by myself and Nettie Boivin and published through Rutledge. So if you've been to any of my other talks or you've had a class with me in the past, you'll know that the sessions allow for chances to pause, to reflect, maybe to interact also. So this means that I'll take some pauses during, during the session itself and encourage you to think, consider different questions really that may come up for yourself or ones that I pose for you. And then as a note to everyone, so while it's not always a typical process for presenting, I will be reading also my slides that and indicating if there's any, you know, meaningful pictures to encourage more inclusive spaces for more people. All right. So why, why the need for another research textbook, right? That's at the heart 
of what I'll be speaking about today and is kind of the teaser that we'll come back to then at the end. To give you a sense of our path today, start with a brief contemplative inquiry, followed by introductions, positionality, thinking about research questions themselves, thinking about key concepts and showing some insights from the chapters in the form of reflections from the field and sample reflective questions. So here's the pause, right? A pause for contemplative research and also pedagogical practice and framework. This is a tool that we can use and I want to go ahead and share a little bit about this. So it encourages us to become more aware and open as Valerie Janicek notes, to deepen our attention and learning as Kakali Bhattacharya mentions, and to recognize the potential of critical self-awareness for qualitative social justice research, a foundation for this book that I wrote. And what you can see then to the side, right, the, the photo of the book and of the sky. So thinking about the sky, this is where we'll, we're going to take a moment. And if y'all want to join me in this, what you'll want to do, you can place your feet firmly on the ground. As I realize my chair is a little bit tall and my feet almost don't touch the ground. But so try to touch the ground, sit up straight. And in a moment, you can close your eyes if you're up for it. And just take a deep breath. Breathe in and hold and out. We'll take another one. Breathe in, hold and out. And with your eyes closed, let's just think for a minute or imagine ourselves being in the same space. So if this were taking place in the library, for instance, maybe you've been to the library rooms or presentations, what would it feel like? You can imagine us all, all sitting together, all being in the same space, all there to learn from each other and to learn something new. One more deep breath. And out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for engaging in that. And so this is a tool that I use in my classes and is something that is central to research and being present with ourselves and with others. So I can tell you a bit more also about myself. So I do specialize in qualitative social justice research, which I've written about. And at the heart of this work is an emphasis on equity and inclusion in education. Through such work, I seek to facilitate the voice of those historically marginalized, oppressed, or colonized, such as through the use of arts-based methods. For example, I started the online arts-based initiative, the Mother Scholar Project, to highlight the presence of mothers in academia a population often overlooked and underserved throughout the academic pipeline. And thankfully, I know in the library over the years, thank you to, to Piotr and others who have invited different discussions about the Mother Scholar Project, about those on campus who are mothers, whether graduate students or faculty or staff. Then also, I have recently completed an online photo voice project, which I I conducted with a PhD student at, at GSE, Jana Ajakinova, and this is what the picture is to the right there, a photo, you see a screenshot of different images that women in academia then shared about their reality during COVID of being suddenly forced to work from home and to, you know, work full time and also have children that they're guiding through online learning. Okay, so to shed a bit more light on my background, which led to the development of this book, I'm going to read an excerpt from the book about my positionality, right? So the positionality and research gives the audience a sense of who I am, right, and why I came about this work. So if you were to look at me from appearances, you might say that I'm, quote, white or maybe a Hispanic woman. To understand more, you could talk with me learn why I grew up, see my identity, and perhaps how I developed my social justice, inclusion, and equity lenses. I am a Sephardic or Spanish Jewish cisgender woman. I pass as white in the United States, but often felt like an outsider, having to prove to others who I was. I was frequently the only Jewish student in my class or workplace and regularly faced hearing, seeing, and experiencing discrimination. My history extends to the Spanish Inquisition, 
where stories were frequently told about our ancestors who had to flee the Iberian Peninsula for fear of their lives as refugees. Another part of my family is also connected to oppression, fleeing persecution in Germany, Hungary, and Russia. Concerns over our safety and well being about being different were and are realities. Today, I'm the mother of two young children, including a gender non binary child. I speak Spanish to them and we have raised them Jewish. We live in Kazakhstan and Central Asia and we're exposed to Kazakh and Russian languages and over 100 nationalities in the country. These historical memories and current realities have led to my commitment to addressing issues of equity, inclusion, and social justice. And my background itself in my teaching draws from Montessori education, which I was educated and taught and developed curriculum, as well as three interdisciplinary degrees, which then inform my work in drawing together different insights from different directions across preschool to graduate levels. So I going to say, what about you, right? So I see it some people that that i know many people who i know but i thought we could just take a moment so you could like raise or just raise your hand or just say you know so who's currently a student or who's an alumni now there's where i'm gonna hear and see hands i see jadra right video so we have alumni staff and faculty. Okay, I think most people know each other. So we have this combination of folks, right, that are here. Thank you so much for coming out. So let's, we can keep on going. Oh, I see in the chat. Alumni, Gaziza, thank you for being here. Okay, so let me tell you a bit more about the book and why I'm excited about it and that it's available for the community. And another alumni, Jadra. Okay. Great. So take a moment and think. So most of y'all, you know, if not everyone, all of y'all, from what I what I know, you've conducted a research study before. Ah, and child. Yay, Liza, thank you. So think about your own research. Have you ever questioned your approaches? Have you ever wondered if you're taking the right steps? Have you ever wondered maybe I could do something differently with my participants? Our community? Have you ever wondered, do I have enough, maybe enough participants, enough data, or wondered, do I have enough trust for this person to share with me? Or are they willing, whether in an interview or even to fill out a survey, right? Do they trust where this is coming from and what will happen with this data? So these questions, among others, are excellent ways to assess ourselves and our work, the quality, the rigor, our commitment to conducting socially just qualitative research. So whether as an early career researcher or more senior researcher, the integration of questions can help open our minds, increase awareness, facilitate improved research. And so the point, a major point of this book then, is to help researchers find the voice and process that works best for, for them, for you, for us, for the qualitative research project. So, you know, I can't tell you if you've built enough trust with your people, right? You're going to interview someone, you have that sense. So it doesn't detail a process of interviewing, for instance, on how to conduct research or how to conduct focus groups. Instead, we provide methodological approaches and address for instance, how power relations are overtly and covertly embedded in, in particular, multicultural research contexts. There's a chance to expand awareness, connect theoretical and conceptual concepts, encouraging to go beyond like just a simple understanding, simple definition, simple yes, no. Yes, I've built enough trust, right? Well, how? Right? How did you do that? And how do you need to return to it, right? Because it's not just now it's done and I don't have to do anything else again, right? That we want to think about this iterative process. So in this way, then having questions throughout the text as you know, the title of the book, so questions in this research, then allow us to return iteratively over time to develop ourselves wherever we are, whether as a new researcher or a longtime researcher. So, 
here we have a picture of students from one of my graduate research methods courses. And, and this is also what really encouraged me to write this book. So offering guidance for early career and established researchers, it emerged from questioning these thought processes of, you know, how do I do my work better? Do I have enough participants? What do I, you know, what do I do moving forward? So in working with master's and doctoral students, teaching research methods and guiding them through their research, these kinds of questions continued to bubble up, right? People would ask them and they're great questions. And I'm so glad that they're being brought up. They need to be. They wanted to know the recipe, right? The formula for doing good, ethical, socially just work. And in working across communities worldwide, we were continually confronted with the fact that there were there was more to be said and learned and shared about working across teams, especially in multicultural contexts, working in different ways, that there wasn't a text that we could just show, oh, here you go, here, here's what you can do to answer this, right? Or to question yourselves and, and to support your journey. So, so the book then, they say that here's a light bulb on the page, right? It gives ideas to address researcher concerns and help with self-awareness to find those answers within ourselves or to know where to go to, to find them elsewhere. The book situates social justice as foundational and qualitative research. So what does it mean to be more socially just in research? How would you define it? Here, I'm gonna take a few seconds and you can think to yourself or write down something. Um, yeah, I would like to say that uh, for me, socially just means in research means um, considering all the responses without um, extra opinion. I mean, uh, the author should uh, rely on each uh, participant and gather uh, everything yeah. from there uh, without uh, tallying, without excluding anything. So this is the justice, I think. That's great. Thank you so much, Liza. Right. So touching upon like not imposing our own views, right? Imposing our own ideas. Anyone else want to jump in? I guess it uh, should be uh, analyzed uh, inclusiveness in uh, any uh, research. Would you say Anyone? that one more time? I would like to say that uh, we should um, support inclusiveness in research. Mm -hmm. It means uh, no, nobody excludes from um, uh, consideration. I mean, nobody's experience should uh, exclude from uh, consideration because uh, people, uh, how to say, uh, the consciousness of opinions is very important for, um, uh, how to say, uh, fully. Uh, conducted research. I mean, fullness, mm -hmm. it's a very important uh, feature of the research. And of course, you should uh, take an account uh, opinion of all uh, people mm -hmm. uh, with whom you, uh, you communicate and so on, d despite of the uh, differences, because differences is also very important uh, input for uh, research. In, uh, differences in opinions, in the, cultural, uh, uh, educational, professional backgrounds, and so on and so on. That's great. Thank you, Piotr, for bringing that in, right? So not, <clears throat> the reverse would be like cherry picking here. I only want to hear from people who agree with my opinion or my, my ideas are ready. And so instead, an expanded understanding. Kelly, would you like to, to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add that I think it really focuses too on the impact that your research has on communities. So not just the uptake of research, not just who's in, I mean, those things are clearly important, but also like really considering how it will impact communities, how it, how it could possibly benefit the communities from which you are, in which you are, with which you are working. That's great. Thank you, Kelly. Right. So then you've expanded, right. So both in you know, talking about the beginning stages of like developing a project where you could also think about how is this affecting and then in recruitment as, you know, and um, data collection as Piotr and Liza were mentioning and then also dissemination and afterward, right, that the, the results 
what is happening after the research project? And then I see, Ankarim, you added that all people should have equal access. These are great. Thank you. And so I'll give you one definition that we have in the book. So we say that for we integrate an interdisciplinary understanding of social justice, that social justice in research is the purposeful commitment and advocacy to address systemic and systematic issues of equity and inclusion, in particular for marginalized and oppressed peoples. So in other words, social justice research can address inequities by actively engaging all participants, all of whom have a stake in the research to the forefront of the discussion. This type of research can help unpack historical and current systems of injustice and instead place at the center of our work, the central nature of working, hearing and amplifying the voices of diverse sets of communities, especially those who have been historically marginalized or excluded. Okay, so the book embeds, right, these ideas of social justice and also ethics as central and throughout all themes, right, that it's not, here's just one chapter and we're going to look at ethics, for instance, instead, ethics applies to any topic, and so does social justice. And so such topics and themes, for instance, uh, relate to power and vulnerability, co-constructing trust, right, it's not just me telling you how it should be, but instead it's the relationship and how does that work? Collaborative, co-produced and arts-based research. So we're seeing more of this community-based research and the recognition of that co-production. And again, what is happening afterward as Kelly, you were mentioning. And then, especially in times of COVID, but even prior to that now, there was, so this transition that we have face-to-face -face and then online interactional research, there's more communities that are accessible through online resources and online modes, but how are we doing that and how does that affect our work? How does that affect the communities and again, then the future of those communities? And so the book draws also from experiences of others. So while Nettie and I wrote the text, the complete text as a whole, we invited people from across the world to share their successes. But in particular, we wanted to hear struggles that they faced and how did they move through it, right? What was their, what were their thinking processes? So that critical self-reflection for others to be able to learn from that. So those were then called reflection from the field or all are called reflection from the field. So we have emerging scholars and more established scholars from across the world, North and South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, foundational scholars such as indigenous rights and decolonial methods. Maybe I would say guru almost, right? Like Linda Tuhiwai Smith and from Donna Mertens, transformative social justice research such as Donna Mertens and Sharon Ravitch, art space research, Patricia Levy, autoethnography, Carolyn Ellis. And I will share a few examples. So here's an excerpt from the first chapter, which is called Owning Our Power. So this is from Kakali Bhattacharya, an award-winning critical contemplative scholar from the University of South Florida. She wrote a reflection, for, reflection from the field on power. So when I think of owning our power, I do not think of power that comes with rank, money or visibility and or other external indicators. Instead, for me, power is internal, imaginal, that manifests outwardly in external relations and practices. I seek guidance from wisdom traditions and lean on contemplative practices such as meditation, mindfulness, writing, movement, and art. My criticality stems from understanding that we live in a national and global cultural landscape that is intersected by mul multiple power structures such as colonialism, patriarchy, Islamophobia, privileged whiteness, ableism, classism, racism, and xenophobia. Therefore, even in contemplation of possibilities of liberation or liberatory agendas, I have an ethical obligation to be mindful of the daily suffering people experience and attend to possibilities of relief from suffering instead of enacting acts of spiritual bypassing. And from the chapter on the spectrum of insider and outsiderness, so these are membership roles of being, you know, am I an insider or an outsider? Linda Tuhiwai Smith, the founder of Colonial Methods, focusing on indigenous communities, wrote, there's nothing like building a wall or bar barbed wire fence to keep people in or out that tells a story about the visible and invisible territorial power 
of borders and boundaries. Escaping over or under or passing through these borders signifies some kind of transition, not just of the physical body, but of the ontological process of changing identity and sense of being. Those visible borders are easy to identify. However, there are many borders less obvious and more subtle in the ways they appear. There are epistemic borders, disciplinary borders, institutional borders, and linguistic and psychological borders. There are borders between categories of reality and fantasy, truth and lies, spirit and body, all of which are socially constructed and reinforced through institutional power. Indigenous researchers often work along the edges of these kinds of borders, work that has marked my career. I've written and taught graduate students about insider-outsider research for decades as a broad but useful concept that covers some of the obvious challenges for researchers working across boundaries or bridging the academic world with indigenous community contexts or working across categories and groups of race, gender, and class, researching up, talking back, or speaking truth to power. The concept is a good entry point to a rich vein of critical thought ethics and personal insight. Okay, and one last one. So from Donna Mertens, foundational scholar who developed the idea of transformative social justice research. She says, many factors in my life led me to develop the transformative approach to research. In 1962, my family moved from Washington State to Kentucky. In Washington State, I only saw people who looked like me, white, middle class. In Kentucky, even though I was only in seventh grade, I was struck by the number of people of color who were living in poverty in the inner city. I asked my teacher why there were no black people in my school, neighborhood or swimming pool. She said that it was because they preferred to be on their own, with their own kind. Even at that tender age, I knew there was something wrong with that explanation. This transformative moment for me was fortunately aligned with the civil rights movement in the United States. I began to ask questions like, what effect are the marches for civil rights having on the lives of Black people? So I had a researcher's way of thinking before I even knew there was such a profession. And then I'm going to continue on. I have a bit more from what you shared. My values led me to work, to want to work to improve conditions for people who were poor or being marginalized for whatever reason. I tried to focus my research work on these communities, but I knew there was something missing the opportunity to be close to or immersed in a community that experienced discrimination on a regular basis. I saw an advertisement to teach research at Gallaudet University in Washington, DC, the only university in the world that serves deaf students as its mission. In my encounters with members of the deaf community, I became aware of the damage done when researchers from outside a community conduct studies that are not responsive to the culture and lived experiences of members of that community. In this case, deaf people were often portrayed as being inferior to hearing people. However, this research did not include deaf people on the research team and rarely, if ever, used a visual language, such as American Sign Language, to ensure accurate communications. Members of the deaf community challenged me to develop an approach to research that was culturally responsive and focused on providing a foundation for constructive action to transform a world in which they experience discrimination and, and oppression on a regular basis. The other fact that was immediately apparent to me was that the deaf community was a microcosm of the larger world and that issues of gender, economic status, religion, language, race, ethnicity, sexual identity, and presence of other disabilities were relevant for a research approach focused on social transformation. So those kinds of reflections continue within each chapter and give us insight, right, about how other people have struggled and the way also that they've moved forward and how they think about their work so here, I say that the book integrates critical self-reflection to enhance self-awareness and growth as a more socially just researcher. So what is, what is critical reflection, right? How can it make us a better researcher? I don't know, do any of y'all use critical self-reflection already in your practice? 
wonder. Yes, we do. Always. Yes. Because teaching itself is a ongoing process, which requires constant self-reflection as well as critical self-reflection. So, and gives opportunity for us to grow as teachers, to be professionals, as well as to be close to our students. Yeah, that's so great. That's great, Jadra. And so as a little bit of background, so Jadra was one of my thesis students and courageously took on a a research project using, using autoethnography and created a, a brilliant thesis, which is now, you know, part of it is under review as an article. So, so the fact that then that you, you self-reflect, it makes a lot of sense, Jadra, and it's great to hear. Okay, so critical self-reflection, the way that we define it in qualitative research emphasizes reflecting on our work so again, this, this concept of the purposeful, to purposefully become better researchers. And so better, right, as you know, th there's no one right or wrong answer for what is better. And so for me, better means more socially just, more equitable, more inclusive. But for you, it may mean something different, right? Or in your particular practice, it could mean something different. But whatever it is, the idea is, how is it, how did my work go? And where can I improve? What resources do I need to go in the direction that I want to go? And then I like this quote from John Dewey. So he says, we do not learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. So I'll give you some examples of some of the, the critical self-reflection questions. So this is an example from the end of the end of the chapter, right? So we have questions. So, but we also have them embedded throughout to offer chances to pause, to reflect. In this way, the text is not just for people to read once and be done from start to end, but you could pick up at any point. It's a companion to help researchers through thinking about their work, who they want to be in research in the world. So this is one example. So the topic, considering power and community. Think of a community you're familiar with. So you can think about in you, right? Or doing research here. The question, who has power? How do you know? How would you define or classify the types of power? Where is knowledge centered in the community? What types of knowledge are present? This is particularly important, I find, in, when I think about teaching and I think about research in, within the classroom also, like, how am I helping to ensure that all voices are being heard and that which not how to highlight the what would refer to as kind of funds of knowledge that each student brings to the class or each person brings and which types then of knowledge are respected and by whom. So here's a sample of an embedded question in the text for the chapter on unpacking the meaning and practice of trust. This is in chapter two. We start with a question or multiple questions for each chapter. So here asking, what does it mean to develop trust within a research study? And as you see again, there's, there's not right or wrong answers, but ones we can continue to return to and consider for ourselves or in teaching. So in teaching research, for instance. So trust is a key concept. We can continue on for each topic. For instance, there's definitions and explanations within the text, such as this one, and as I had described before, social justice. But so trust offers broadly an opportunity to establish and nourish a belief in research, especially when investigating marginalized and diverse communities. Trust is, is composed of parts creating the notion of someone or something as being trustworthy and not just the connection one has with people. And that sense of trustworthiness is going to vary across communities, across contexts, even within the same city, right? Or in the same family, right? And think about family members who might have a different sense of, you know, what can I tell this family member versus that one and who is trustworthy and why? So we've created connections between topics as there's no simple separations, as I mentioned, between such things as power and trust vulnerability, relationships. So we offer questions to consider, such as how can we work to allow and facilitate other people's own voices without inadvertently imposing our own prejudices, authority, and power on another set of people? So this returns to 
Liza's point at the beginning, right? That here, listening and hearing other people's voices and their experiences. So lastly, how do we, as qualitative, socially justice-minded researchers, or as social justice-minded researchers of any type, find our path forward in an increasingly diverse and multicultural world? Again, not a simple, right? <laughs> There's one answer and this is how we do it. But one way that, that I address it and that we think about it as then saying that one response or a simple response is that we take it step by step and see what we can learn from others where our growing awareness critical self-reflection can enhance qualitative inquiry and social justice so why the need for another research textbook so coming back to this question right so questions in qualitative social justice and in, in multicultural contexts it offers a chance to guide ourselves and others through questions and concerns in researching in multicultural contexts to expand critical self-reflection and awareness and ultimately to enhance socially just research. So as a, a final quote here, I wanted to share one of the endorsements, this one from Anthony or Tony Anwigbuzi from the University of Cambridge, a social justice mixed method scholar. So he wrote, Questions in Qualitative Social Justice Research in Multicultural Contexts is a unique textbook that provides a much needed guide to help researchers engage in reflexivity and criticality. Simply put, this inspirational book begins to fill a void in a way that will make a significant contribution to the literature. Thank you so much for offering this chance for me to come out, for all of you being here. It's really a pleasure to be here with y'all. I look forward to questions, comments now or in the future. And really the last slide, I wanted to just show you more students and more, oh, I thought Jother, you were on one of these. I mean, <laughs> you're not in this one or maybe. So anyway, thank you all. It is really, it's wonderful to be here and I will go ahead and stop screen sharing. Thanks. Uh, can we ask questions, please? Yes, please. Okay, first of all, I congratulate you on this amazing book and it's an honor to be here because your presentation was uh, food for thought, I would say. So I have a question. So you said that researchers should be aware yeah, of the context. So what if, for example, the researcher is not aware of the context that uh, his or her participants were discriminated, but uh, his or her focus is a different thing and uh, the researcher is not aware uh, of the discrimination. So to what extent uh, findings of this research would be legitimate or we could say trustworthy? Um, mm. Just I would like to know opinion. Interesting question. Okay, Jadra. So if, so hidden, you know, aspects. So for instance, I'm researching, let's say on the topic of teacher, you know, how teachers transition during for online learning, but I didn't know about, you know, their own personal struggles or either current or historical struggles. Would that be part of the question maybe? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. All right. So uh, it's a great question. And really th this gets to the heart of being transparent or this would be one response that I would have and others could, could respond also, right? Their own insights. But if I'm transparent about what it is that here, I'm going into the, this research for, the, for this way and for this reason, and I'm articulating that in my research, um, any kinds of dissemination, then, then somebody could bring up, right? Like I can, I can mention or I can think about even before going in that I recognize I don't know, I don't know best about this community. And I guess that's then kind of circling back. That that's at the heart. I am not the um the expert on somebody else, period. Right. Like even if we have the the same job, even if we have the same, right, like seem like we have the same background. I don't know their experience. I don't know their baggage. I don't know their history. And so if it, the more that as relevant to, to the research that you're looking to uncover, 
right? So in this case of teachers during online learning, we know that it is important to know some of the background, to understand who has access to um, internet at home, right? Who, uh, who else is in the household, right? Like if I'm not asking, if I wanna know about their online teaching, but I don't know that they have multiple kids and parents perhaps mm -hmm. and other relatives in the house who are all using the same internet and have one space to do this, then I'm missing the context. And so then if I do present about it, right? And say, mm -hmm. oh, without any of that, then hopefully people would say, well, well, what about, you know, how many people lived in the house or what was their internet like, or what was their, you know, access to other resources. And then I then have a choice, right? Like there's always going to be something that everybody misses in research, right? You can't do everything just as in life, right? There's, there's always going to be something to, that's going to be missed. So I can choose to either be defensive and say, well, this is good exactly the way it is or I can be reflective, right? I can be critically self-reflective and say, thank you for that question, right? That's a really good point. That's something that I need to go back and, or I could go back and look at, or I hope you go back and look at it, right? My research is done, right? And so it's, it's an important thing to consider. And so that's where, you know, so the fact that you're even asking that, that question, Jadra, means that it's already on your mind. And that's a, that's a good step to right to understand then what is what is the context of this study that I'm doing. Anyone else want to sure? Kelly, you might have some deep thoughts that look like you were maybe or you could add to it if you'd like. I, I'm really I'm wondering. Um, so I mean, I know it's a book on qualitative work, but also you mentioned quite a few mixed methods researchers. And my background is a, my dissertation was quantitative, but I've done a lot of qualitative. And what I found in my quantitative work is that the reflexivity and the practices associated with reflexivity weren't for whatever reason, uh, translating into my quantitative work. And so it's, um, I'm curious what your thoughts are, um, if, if, you know, if that's not too far out of the scope and uh, what that might look like for quantitative and qualitative work. I, I love thinking about that. Yeah, and it's a really, so thinking about the reflexivity as it move into quantitative research. So the mixed methods researchers that, that I included in particular, so Tony on Onwabuzi and Donna Mertens, they both use this form of transformative mixed methods, where which it means that they, they go back to the community multiple times, or this is usually the case, right? So you start a study, maybe you start with a survey and then you do interviews and then you find from the interviews that there's something else that has come out that the community wants. And so you go back to maybe do GPS, you know, design a, a you know, quantitative aspect and then you find something else. So it's continuing and consistently working with the community for the goal of the transformative social justice for the community or for the participants. And so for them, that then, that's a mindset that they would be reflexive and they would discuss it and they would think about their positionality and mention it. And then for, so the world of quantitative, what it seems like when it's the pure quantitative, it's, you know, we can think about the ways that our, you know, um, publishing, academic publishing, uh, accepts different types of articles or the way that we write, there's this idea still, if we just separate, you know, qual and quant, there's this idea, so mixed makes it fuzzier, right? But with qualitative is, you know, people would say it's more subjective, right? You're bringing in your own self to it. Quantitative is you know, the story being the false story is that it is objective, right? You're using third person writing versus first person. And yet I would argue that, well, you're a person, you bring your person to any research, right? And so even if I'm sending out a survey online, the, the text, the way that I have written my question comes across for somebody else, even in an anonymous survey, right? There, me, myself is still within that. And so I think that, 
you know, the way that I see the, fu the future of research, and this is where mixed methods and, you know, we can think of other designs, community-based participatory research designs offer chances to, to blur that and to recognize that there's not, there's not the, the pure objective side uh, of research. I think it's going to take a long time, right? Like we still, we still prize that, you know, the, the response, let's say to, you know, how do we solve, you know, these wicked problems of the world, right? How do we solve climate change? How do we solve, you know, inequity? And when somebody can say, well, you do one, two, three, you do these things, it's like, oh, that's great. Now I know I have the solution, but it's not that simple, right? And, and so we know that, like, we know that in our heart that it's not that simple, but we, it, but people in general, right? Like, it's nice to have, just do this and it will solve the problem. So, you know, the fact, again, that, you know, that we can come here and that we can talk about this and that we can think about it and that we can, you know, that if, you know, those who have some background in, in reflexivity or interest in it are then on review boards for, you know, journal articles that are mixed methods or quantitative, that then allows the chance to suggest other ways of doing it. Um, as those who are faculty and staff are encouraging different types of writing styles, that you could have a quantitative study and, it, you know, work with or mentor or learn yourself maybe how to, how could I push the boundaries of a purely quantitative study and maybe use first person, right? Like that's really out there, <laughs> but you know, maybe that will come. <laughs> it's, come on in, yeah. we're gonna say now something that, else. <laughs> now that you mentioned that, I think about my dissertation and I had an anthropologist as my chair and my dissertation was quant using structural equation modeling and demographic health survey data. And all the things she wanted to like twist and not twist, but like morph and change in a more, now that I think about it, this a couple of years ago, they were ever quant people were like, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. And so now that I think about my dissertation, I think, oh, that opportunity was completely pushed out the door because of that. I, what is uh, all of us, me, my committee, everybody's kind of challenge in accepting that as a dissertation process. Thank you. That was really helpful. <laughs> yes, it, that's, it, and we'll be able to move forward, hopefully, right? Like, or we have seen shifts, right? So we think about these dissertation communities. We have um, seen the ways in which, you know, on on a very different level, that there have been. Um, not only autoethnographic studies as dissertations, but also novels in some places where this is the first novel that was written as a dissertation that came up fairly recently, or using comic books to actually show a dissertation study. And so the the more innovative we're willing to to try that we can, you know, slowly or in great bursts, right? Like try out different things and the willingness that the fact again that we're here and thank you again to the NU library, to Piotr and, and Liza for being able to facilitate this conversation for us to think about and have these moments of like, oh, maybe I could do this a little bit differently or maybe I could work with somebody else in this other way, right? Maybe I could order a textbook that is, you know, or this text or whatever, use some other reading that maybe is a little bit different in whatever way, right? Whichever mindset you come about it with. Thank you. I just noticed the time for, we're wrapping up, right? <laughs> um, I have one more question. I hope uh, it's a little bit different than the previous questions. And um, I'm concerned about the book cover. I know you are very careful with picking up the colors, pictures, with the design of everything. So I'm curious, what what is the prehistory of your book cover? What is it? Hi, <laughs> ah, right? Yes. So the the story with the book cover is that, so there in the in some different places. So in the U.S., sometimes we talk about having you know, a, a melting pot, that the U.S. is a melting pot of different that metaphor, right? Here, people from all over and mixed together to produce this, you know, this concept of who we are. 
when I studied actually anthropology, so bringing up anthropology in my master's in particular, we talked about how there's other ways to think about it and that the melting pot actually has forced, at least in the US context, and I know this has happened in other places as well, for people to uh, assimilate at, like immediately and, oh, you need to speak English because you're an American, right? Like, and that the idea of having another culture was diminished it still is in the schools in some places not allowed to speak your native languages not allowed to talk about or wear your native clothes and so instead there's this idea there's another that you know um, forgetting who it came from but that maybe initially um, transposed on to Canadian society which also has its own struggles in terms of this assimilation and how they they treat indigenous and various communities but the idea of a salad bowl, and so this is right the front cover, the salad bowl. So, which is hard to see. I don't think it will show up. Okay, so a salad bowl, but it's behind you, Liza. That with the salad bowl, each person, each community is its own individual, right? It is so if I'm a tomato and somebody else is a piece of lettuce, and you know, these pieces then come together into one one space, but it's not. I'm not looking for you to change from being a lettuce to being a tomato, right? Like, like I recognize that you're different. You bring something unique to the salad. To, you bring something unique to the community, to the, the to the diverse world in which we live, and that's a beautiful thing, right? It makes the it it makes the meal in this case, right? Like much more interesting. It allows the recognition of individuals and a respect for even if maybe you don't maybe you don't want to be like you know this other person or salad piece or whatever right or you don't want it as a part of your own community you can still respect it right you still respect it's there and you can still recognize that it has value so so that's where the idea came from and thank you for that question i hadn't even thought about touching upon that it's really useful I knew that this has such a deep uh, meaning. I knew that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Liza. Thank you all. Yeah. Is there any other questions from the participants? Yeah. So it's already uh, one, one hour question. left. Uh -huh. Yeah. First of all, uh, first of all, I am sorry for my uh, turn of. Uh, the microphone and I, uh, I uh, shared my, uh, uh, I say, <clears throat> understanding of what is uh, the socially uh, just research uh, before. Uh, now my question is about uh, can we uh, consider each individual as uh, separate in, uh, independent uh, cultural content or not? Mm. Do you understand what I mean? Each individual as a separate culture? Co uh, uh yes content context okay a separate cultural context very very interesting question so i think uh, there would be some some different opinions about this um in in general for for me or the way that we're looking at 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 research is then to think in or multicultural context is to recognize the relationships and the ways in which you know, if I, if you just look at me and you don't consider, you know, a kid that might suddenly come into the room or, you know, the, the positionality, right, that, that I mentioned, then you don't have a sense of, of where I've gotten to this place or what the, the, of who I am. So while you might not know everything, so like, you know, Jadra's question, right, that, that you wouldn't know this positionality unless I shared it, or you wouldn't know that I have kids unless they came in. But, but for, for me in thinking about research, I need to go beyond the individual and to recognize that I have been shaped, all of us have been shaped by societal factors. So those ones I gave were very, were small, smaller to me, but the societal fact, um affects the societal pressures the cultural context of whether you know i lived in the us before and where did i live and then i came here and then what those histories are 
all affect me, right? What we see on TV affects us, right? We're all gendered people, right? We talked about this in the Gen Con talk yesterday, that even if a research study doesn't specifically look at gender, there's a gender component, right? That because we're all gendered individuals, organizations are gendered. And so it's all there. And the way that we even think of gender is socially constructed, right? And changes and shapes and morphs. So the an important kind of last point here that uh thank you for bringing this up Piotr is recognizing that while I might think that so if I go beyond the individual and I think that oh okay here I'm going to study other for instance mothers in academia a topic and a community that I that I research frequently and work with uh, that that I still don't know I don't know them, right? Like I know them, but I don't know them. And that's why I give the example and we have a chapter about the spectrum of insider and outsider roles, that it's not just, oh, I'm an insider because I'm a mother in academia, or I'm an outsider because I'm not a Kazakh mother in academia, right? But instead finding where is it that I align and where is it that I don't and how is that um reflected in how I talk and work with with other people to understand their experiences and what is it that they want to share to be heard and what is what is the future that they see that could then be more equitable and more inclusive does that answer it Pieter yes because it's a very um, important issue for our librarians uh, because um, I would like to say that um, uh, one phase of the library is a uh, um, cultural uh, uh, institution and uh, in my opinion uh, cultural it's um, like a common uh, level of um, uh, understanding uh, each people uh, rep representing uh, uh, different cultures uh, like uh, doing uh, business, uh, culture of speech, culture of uh, rights and culture of uh, uh, research thinking and so on and so on. So it's like um, the library should uh, uh, create some, uh, should create uh, some uh, common um, high level culture in different uh, uh, aspects uh, like I mentioned uh, culture of writing, culture of uh, thinking uh, and so on and so on. But, uh, from uh, other side, I think uh, uh, the library should um, recognize uh, each uh, person individually. Uh, it's uh, mm -hmm. not like uh, in, uh, enforce a person to be uh, a better uh, in individual, but uh, to show uh, ways how you uh, can be uh, better than uh, in present. Uh, present. Understand mm -hmm. me what I mean? It's uh, it's quite a, a complicated issue for librarians to provide uh, some ways to uh, for development uh, ourselves, uh, but uh, at, uh, at the same time to um, keep uh, personality of uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, of the people to that, be individual. Wow. That's uh, thank you for bringing that up. I didn't. I didn't realize the the efforts in, in that focus of the cultural institution for the library. And so in that re that regard, what it really makes me think of is this, this concept of back to this idea of funds of knowledge. So for instance, when you're teaching, where the recognition that actually the individual, so if this one individual, for instance, somebody comes in in a in the classroom, I've thought about this in terms of or worked with students, somebody is in a wheelchair. Well, how does your classroom need to change its organization? In many of our rooms, for instance, there's not there's not a wide enough aisle, right, for a wheelchair to actually get down in the various areas. And so here I'm just thinking about this one person, right? But, but I need to think of that one person in order to have an inclusive space. And so that's what I'm hearing from you also, that here you you are looking to, or the library is looking to recognize and value the individual. And that is, that's incredibly powerful and important, uh, important work to recognize that, especially on such an international campus, right? That we have a lot of different needs of what type of, 
what types of resources to have available and all kinds of, you know, physical, electronic, but also um, other kinds of medium and um, activities and such, right, that are a part of, I think, the mission of what you focus on. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Great. Oh, it's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. This has really been wonderful to be here with you all. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Again, Liza, Piotr, to the library in general, and all of y'all taking your time out today. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much for your works, for your research, and sharing your results with us. We uh, wish you good luck and more books to be printed soon, published. <laughs> so, Thank you. Uh, I, we are recording this session and I will be sending it to you, Anna, so you can post it on your GenCon website. Also, we will also uh, on our YouTube channel publish this soon. Um, uh, everything was great. Thank you to all. I hope we'll have one more session very soon. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm going to stop recording right now. Mm -hmm.